TrainerTest.com provides practice exams for the VMware VCP with this and many other embedded videos. Go to TrainerTests.com and try a free demo today. So what we're going to look at here is vSAN and some of the basics of vSAN. Um, so first off, we're going to establish a host cluster. Right? And a host cluster can be used for a number of different purposes. Right? We can use it for things like high availability, DRS, etc. And, and what we're going to use it for in this particular case is vSAN. Right. So we're going to create a vSAN cluster uh, of, of ESXi hosts. And I've shown the minimum configuration here. For vSAN 6, the minimum number of hosts is 3. Um, the maximum number, assuming that you've upgraded to vSphere 6, the maximum number of hosts that you can do in a vSAN cluster is 64. So prior to enabling vSAN on this cluster, there's a few things that we should do. Right? We should, number one, create a VM kernel port. And we have to create our vSAN network. So we're going to create a VM kernel port marked for vSAN on each one of these ESXi hosts. Right, there's my VM kernel port marked for vSAN traffic on each of those ESXi hosts. And we talked a little bit about some of the practices here yesterday as far as these VM kernel ports go and as far as the network itself is concerned. Um, we're not going to have any kind of load balancing. If we have multiple physical adapters, we'll just use the originating virtual port ID nick teaming method. And so these VM kernel ports are going to be created on a virtual switch. And so if you're preparing for the VCP exam, here's some of the basics that you need to know for that virtual switch. Right, related to the VM kernel and, and just some general stuff. Um, when we create a virtual switch, we can uh, assign physical adapters to it. Right? Those physical adapters are called VMNICs. So here on my first host, I've got two VMNICs. Same on my second host. And same on my third host. And so I create these virtual switches, whether it's the distributed virtual switch or standard virtual switch. From a physical standpoint, it basically looks the same. And on my physical network, I'm going to have switches. So let's go ahead and populate this with two physical switches. And maybe, you know, the, the best practice for vSAN is to have a 10 gig network. All right, so let's say I'm trying to do this on the cheap. So I've got a 10 gig physical switch here. <clears throat> that kind of aligns with my best practices. But maybe I've also got a less expensive 1 gig physical switch. Or maybe I'm using just some ports on a VLAN on some other physical switch that I'm using for some other purpose, right? So maybe I've dedicated one 10 gig switch specifically to vSAN, but I want to have a backup switch just in case that switch breaks. And so I can do this. This is a, this is a valid configuration. What I can do is I can connect the VMNICs, one of the VMNICs on each virtual switch to my primary physical switch. Right? And, and those will be active adapters. Right? So I'll mark those adapters as active. So this guy right here is active. Then I can set up an additional VMNIC, an additional physical adapter on each of these virtual switches, but maybe I want to designate that one as a standby adapter right? and hook them up to my kind of cheap switch, right? Maybe there's a switch that I use for other things. Maybe it's just a, a, a little, you know, one gig, very basic physical switch, right? Well, that, that's a vi viable option. And then what I'll do is I'll designate those physical adapters as standby adapters. And what that means is that those physical adapters are only going to be used if the primary adapter fails. So now I've, I've got redundancy. Right? Now I've got redundancy built into my network. And I know that the 10 gig adapters are going to be used under normal circumstances because those are the only adapters that are active. 
So now I've got my, my cluster of hosts. I've got my networking set up. And so now I'll actually go ahead on my cluster and I'll enable vSAN. And on those ESXi hosts in the cluster, we're doing the minimum, right? We've got three ESXi hosts here. So each one of these hosts is going to have to contribute at least one disk group. So let's draw some disks. Let's say that my circles here represent hard disks, right? I'm just, let's just say I'm just going to do three. Three hard disks per disk group. You can do up to seven. These are our capacity devices, right? These are the things that provide the long-term storage. Um, they're, they're, they're not for caching. They're our capacity devices. Right. So that's what those guys are. Those are our capacity hard disk drives. And, and this is a hybrid approach to vSAN. We're not doing all flash in this case, right? We've got capacity disks that typically have a lot more space but don't perform as well as SSD. Well, now let's plug in some SSD. There's my SSD. And for each disk group, oops, let me make that a different color. For each disk group, I've got to have one flash device. All right. Maximum of one flash device per disk group. Right. So there are my flash devices right there. One per disk group. And so let me just kind of highlight here, each of these on each of my ESXi hosts has now been equipped with one disk group. And I mentioned uh, <clears throat> a little earlier, so we've got different claim modes that we can use with those disk groups. Right? So each of these yellow boxes represents a disk group. So let me notate that here as well. Here's my disk groups. And so those disk groups can be created using manual claim mode where I'm specifically choosing which disks are part of which disk group or I can use an automatic claim mode where vSAN is just going to do this on the fly on its own. Now what if I wanted to improve the performance of vSAN? Let's say that it's not as fast as I would like it to be. Well, what I can do is I can always add an SSD device on one of these hosts. But I can't add it to the existing disk group, so I'll have to create a new disk group and either allocate maybe some additional capacity devices, or maybe if I'm just trying to improve performance, maybe I take some of the uh, capacity devices that are on the other disk group and I break it up into two disk groups here. So now I've got more flash, right? The ratio of flash to capacity has changed, right? The, the, the guideline is you want to be at about 10%, right? So if you've got 100 gigs of capacity, you want to have at least 10 gigs of flash. But if you can get that ratio even higher, if, if the percentage of flash is even higher, then you're going to have better performance. And because all of the reads, that means you're going to be able to store more data in the read cache and so more data is going to get read off of flash versus capacity versus hard disks and also give you a larger write buffer for write operations. So that's the basics of what we covered yesterday. Right? That kind of sums up what we covered yesterday. Now the, the other thing that I'll just throw out there is that <clears throat> We also need to maintain reliability and availability of data. Right, so let's throw one more thing up on our diagram here, which is starting to get pretty full. Uh, let's throw a virtual machine on. VM1, I'm going to call it. So VM1 is running on this host on the far right. There's VM1. Right. So we have all these different disk groups, and these are disks that are installed on different physical hosts. So we can't create like a big RAID array right, that includes all of these disks. So we don't really have a reliability mechanism 
that that's that's built in right here. What vSAN is going to do is it is going to handle striping and mirroring on a per object basis. So one of the objects that's included with VM1 is its VMDK file. Another one is its home namespace. The namespace includes things like VMX files, etc. We're going to take those objects. Let's just focus on the VMDK for the moment. Let me just clear that out and we'll just look at a VMDK. So one of the objects of this virtual machine is one of its disks. And I'm going to kind of surround that with a new color that I haven't used yet here. Here's my VMDK object. Right. Now that's the object. That object is going to be comprised of multiple components. So for example, if I want to protect this object from a single host failure or single disk failure, single failure of any kind, I'll create a copy of that object on one host and then I'll create a replica on yet another host. And this kind of goes back to why we need three ESXi hosts. Because not only do I need two copies of that data on two different hosts, but I also need a witness. And that witness is going to exist on the third ESXi host. Right? And the witness kind of controls uh, the, the failover if the, if the active replica it becomes unavailable, the witness is what controls that failover uh, to the replica that was not being used. Right? So, for example, let's say that the active object is here, or the active component is here, and that host fails. It's the witness's job to detect that situation and make the other replica active. Now let's talk a little bit about what happens here, right? We're, 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 we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit now, but let's talk a little bit about what happens when that ESXi host fails. And I'm going to clean up some of this stuff here real quick because I need a little more room. So let's say, for example, in this scenario, it, maybe I don't have a, f a three host cluster. Maybe I didn't just do the minimum. Maybe I actually have a four host cluster. Well, let's add it. Let's add a fourth host, right? I'm going to expand out my switches a little bit just to make my diagram make sense here. All right, so I have a fourth host in the mix and that, that host is connected. Just assume it's connected the same way as the other hosts are. When that second host fails, two things are going to happen. Number one, vSAN is going to detect that failure and cut over to the replica, or cut over to the component that is still available. The other thing that vSAN will do in the background is it will attempt to enforce its storage policies. So for example, let's say in this case, I have a storage policy that says protect from a single failure. Right? That storage policy basically dictates that this object needs to be mirrored to two different devices. Right? When that second host fails, when, when that host failure occurs, that storage policy is impossible to achieve. I don't have three hosts available anymore or I don't have those three hosts. If I have a fourth host though, vSAN will handle basically um, bringing it back into compliance with the policy. vSAN will create another component to replace that failed replica. It'll basically re-protect itself. So that's how vSAN handles a failure like this. If that fourth host didn't exist, if it wasn't there, then there's no way that that storage policy could be fulfilled. Now, it'll still continue to run, it'll work, but there's no way 
that that storage policy can continue to be fulfilled because I don't have enough hosts to make it happen. One final aspect I want to talk about here is what does force provisioning mean? What is force provisioning? Well, let's say you decided to create yet another virtual machine right now, right? Another virtual machine that complies with that storage policy. Well, there's no way that I can create a virtual machine that complies with that storage policy because I don't have enough hosts to make it happen. If you've enabled the force provisioning policy in your storage policy, what that will mean is that virtual machines can be provisioned and created even if their policies cannot be satisfied. So that's an option that you can set up in your, your storage policies for vSAN. Basically say, even if you can't satisfy the criteria of this policy, still create virtual machines. And if that failure is resolved in the future, right? I bring this ESXi host back and now I have it third host again, those storage policies will be enforced at that point. Right? vSAN will automatically do what's called a rebalance and it'll create those replica objects once that third host is available. Any questions on any of this? To learn more about these concepts and to prepare for your VCP exam, go to www.trainertests.com. These practice exams include this and many other embedded videos. And you can try a free demo. There's a 100% money back guarantee and it has over 170 questions. And as you answer those questions at the end of the exam, it'll tie them all to the exam blueprint and show you which areas you need to work on. So there's really no better way to prepare for the VCP6 exam than to go to www.trainertests.com and try one of our practice exams.